Where should we sit at a great banquet? That's what we're going to talk about today in Luke 14. All right, we've been having some very serious chapters. Obviously, we're moving our way towards Jerusalem, and so this is just going to get more serious. We've seen this happen in the other two Gospels we've done already. Jesus is coming to a head with Herod, with Pilate, with the temple structure, and he is meeting his challenge head on. He's not a man who was warned last time to go away, get out of Jer- Jerusalem. You're going to end up like John the Baptist. He is not hiding from anybody. So again, we start out in 14. He is at Sabbath and he was dining at, it says, one of the ruler of the Pharisees. So he is starting to be among higher level people. And it says that they were watching him carefully. Someone said this word for watching is not like I would watch and say, I'm very curious about what he's going to do now. This is more of a sinister, it said, word of like espionage. I'm putting you under scrutiny, it says in Barclay. They are looking, I guess, to get him in trouble. It said, and behold, there was a man who had dropsy. That's an ESV. So behold, like he just appeared. People wondered, did the Pharisees bring him to trap Jesus on healing? And, you know, because he's been going out and doing all these minor temples and these other temples and the words getting out that he's doing these things. Now we're with a higher level of Pharisees. And so was this a trap? I mean, I wouldn't doubt it. Jesus is like, is it lawful to heal on Sabbath or not? And they all just stayed quiet. I always find that to be interesting is that when Jesus challenged people and they don't have anything to say, their silence is deafening. Because again, if they said, no, it's not lawful for them to heal on the Sabbath, well, someone would say, well, well, where's that written? Where is it written that you can't heal on Sabbath? Or if they said it was legal, then what Jesus is doing is fine. They, they don't want to look and put their vote down on anything. That that's kind of makes them into cowards. So he heals the man. And, you know, Jesus is like, if you had a son or an ox that fell down the well, you could pull them out. You would save them. But for this man, you can't do anything because you're hiding behind your rules. Now there's a parable of people who were invited to this wedding feast. They chose to sit in the place of honor. I think about it as like if you were invited to your friend's wedding or your friend's kid's wedding and you went and sat at the table where the bride and the groom sit. I'm just I'm going to be up here because I'm super important that you're not supposed to do that. It says that basically it's going to be embarrassing to you when you go up to this place of honor and someone says, no, 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 you got to go sit in the back. Instead, if you go sit in the back, the lowest place, and then your friend comes up and says, no, you're very honored. Please come sit up up here with the bride and the groom in the wedding feast. Then suddenly this person's exalted. In this particular case, there's people out there who think they're in high position, who love to walk, as it says, in the marketplace and have people admire their robes. They think that they are the leaders of this temple movement, that people honored them in so many ways. I think that's how they think about being at the banquet of God, that God is going to prepare for them a special place. Reminds me of what, who's the greatest apostle? Who's going to sit on your left and your right? And Jesus says, you know, it's going to be this little kid. That's who's going to sit on my left and my right. Or this thief on the cross. That's who's going to be on my left. You know, this idea of putting yourself up, of pridefulness. This is a huge sin. A lot of people feel that pride is what causes all the other sins. But you shouldn't have pride. You shouldn't put yourself in a position where you're higher than you think you are. First of all, you're going to get knocked down. You're going to be brought to reckoning. Someone even indicated, I wish I knew who said this, that there's really only one sin on earth. And that is the sin of, I know better. God said this, but you know what? I know better. God said we shouldn't do this thing. You know what? But I know better. That is pride. And and it's the same kind of pride that lets you say, I'm going to sit next to the most important person at this table. I'm going to go to the head of the wedding banquet when you don't even exist to be there. Then there's the other parable, the great banquet. A man gave a dinner banquet or something like that. So he gave a dinner and you invite your friends, your brothers, your neighbors, your rich neighbors, it says, and so that you're going to be repaid. You're going to go to their banquet. 
you're going to be honored. Say, oh, did you go to Jill's dinner? Oh, it was amazing. And I get honor because I invited these very fancy people to come to my meal. But what Jesus is saying instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed because they can't pay you anything. You know, that's the thing. You cannot be repaid, but you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Oh, boy, you know, so that's a big thing is that we do things a lot of times to get honors. You'll see people, and I'm not just picking on Hollywood because we do it too, but they try to invite the most important people to be shown with the best people coming to their party. They do that because it's honoring to them. See, the president came to my birthday party or this person came to my wedding party. And instead, Jesus is saying, don't do that. You want to really be blessed? Invite the people who can't give you a thing for this blessing. Doesn't everybody need to hear the word of God? Should go to church? Should be offered a seat? Hopefully we never go down that path. When we're having these meals, we're having these places of honor. There's no honor greater than ministering to the people who have nothing and have no power and no ability. This is a blessing to us. Jesus gives them a parable. Big banquet. He sends all the servants out to the people who should be invited. Come on, banquet's here. You all said that you're going to come to my big feast. This is my big barbecue that we're going to have. And then the first guy's like, well, I bought a field. And so I have to go see it. And then the next guy said, well, I bought ox and I have to go examine them. And then the third one was like, I can't come right now because I just got married. And so all these people who were supposed to be for who this feast was inviting were making up excuses. Were they good excuses? Were they bad excuses? They seem legit, but you know that when someone puts something as a priority, they make it a priority. If you had said to that person, come to my house, I have 5,000 denarius for you, they'd be there, right? But it, obviously this person was not a priority to them because if they were, they would have come. The servant said, you know, hey, we did all this and, and no one came. So now he says, well, instead, Go out to the highway and the hedges and and get people. It says compel. It doesn't mean compel. Compel, we think of it being forced. I think we think of compel in this case of convincing, talking to, um, imploring. Please come to this festival, this feast that we have here. People, I guess, in history took this word compel in the sense of force people. Do not force people to go to Jesus. That is not what he's saying here. Instead, he's like, Beg them, invite them, tell them about this, ask them to come because all those other people, they're not tasting my banquet. And so it's another situation where the original people were asked to do these things by God and they're not doing them now. They're not coming now that Jesus is here. Out of all the centuries, we've been hoping for the Messiah, we've been praying for the Messiah, we've been wanting him to come here. And now Jesus is here and they don't want him. They're not respecting him. They're not listening to the things he has to say. And so now God is going out and telling everybody, please come to my banquet. People are invited to come to the banquet of God, and yet they are rejecting him, not God who is holding the banquet for us all. Now we talk about another serious topic, which the crowds are around him. And again, the crowds are going to be a mixed bag, right? The apostles are the 12. The disciples are the people who believe in Jesus. And then the crowd is going to be a mixture of interested parties, people who want to see what he's going to do next, Pharisees, Sadducees, the whole crowd is going to be everybody. And so the crowd, it says, accompanied him, meaning they followed him like they're following him everywhere. And he says to them, if anyone comes to me and doesn't hate his own father and mother, children, his brother, even his own life, you can't be my disciple. Whoever doesn't bear his cross can't be my disciple. Serious talk here. It reminds me a little bit of if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. There are many times that we've seen in the gospel where Jesus uses extreme language to prove a point. And in this particular case, it's not about hating your father and mother. It is using a drastic language to say nothing is more important than your relationship with me. Even your own life. If you don't bear your cross, if you don't give up things for me, 
you can't be my disciple. I have to come first all the time. And that's what we were talking about before. It can't be money. It can't be fear. It can't be anxiety. It can't be now your mother and your brother and your sister, your own life. It can't be whether you want a house or you want to bury your father in a couple of years. This has to come first. And he's using extreme language, not so that we fight with our mothers and our brothers, but we understand how important it is, how important putting Jesus first in our lives is. And that means, he says, that if you're going to build a tower, you're going to sit there and figure out the cost. You know, how much is it going to cost for me to build this tower and whether or not you can pay for it. Lay the foundation. If you get started and you can't pay for this and everyone's just going to laugh at you because you started it and you can't now finish it. If a king goes to war, it says, aren't you going to figure out what you need to win this war? And in the same way, if you don't look at the cost, if you don't look at the ledger sheet of what it costs to follow me, it's renounce everything. You're not going to be my disciple. It's calling us back to those people who want to follow Jesus, but they don't want to give it at all. All those people came to Jesus and said, well, I want to bury my father first, or I want to hang out with my family a little bit longer. Or I want to have my riches. It's not that any of those things are bad, having family, having money, burying your father. They're all neutral or fine things. The problem is, is they were put first. And we can't have anything first. When I first started working at InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, which is a college student organization, if you don't know, my boss once said to me that she knew that her husband was the right man. He loves Jesus more than he loves me. And I'm a new Christian, right? So I'm like, well, why is that good? I would want a husband who loves me more than anything, right? Early Christian, not getting it. She goes, well, he could cheat on me. He could fall out of love with me. There are things he could do that would end our relationship. But if he loves Jesus more than anything on this planet, he will be faithful to me. He will love me and treat me like God wants him to treat me. That's the most important thing. Now sits with me of this. Putting God first is hard. But when we do, it makes us be the best kind of friend the best kind of marriage partner, the best kind of person to help you. Because the things of this world come and go. Our feelings about people come and go. But if Jesus is always the first, we're always, what it says, carrying the cross, which again, the cross always leads to death in the Roman world. If we're all willing to give up everything to be with Jesus. He will be first in our lives. And that's what Jesus is looking for. It's not meaning that we're going to be perfect at it because we're flawed human beings. But this is the relationship he wants us to have, is him being in the position where he is first in our lives. And again, extreme language, like plucking out your eye, hating your family, all very extreme things. But he is saying, this is how important it is. And most of the commentaries wanted to point this out in case I don't say it strongly enough. Hate is a figurative term. It says that it's about what's a priority in our life. We are not supposed to hate our family or pluck out our eyes. It is about putting the most important things first. And he says, salt is good, but if it loses its taste, how is the saltiness brought back? How is it restored? It's no use for the soil or the manure pile. It's just thrown out. Once salt loses its salty properties, it's no good for anybody. Just like salt should have saltiness, a follower of Jesus should have that nature of Christ, that relationship, that putting it first. And if you have lost your saltiness, if you've lost that relationship, if you are no longer having that commitment to Christ where he is first, you will lose your saltiness. You will lose the very aspects of you that are valuable. God's word is the salt, is the purification. And when we lose that, we lose everything that's important in life and in our salvation. Or even bringing it back, the narrow gate. If you lose that saltiness, are you going to be like that person where Jesus says, I never knew you? Well, 
Okay, so that ends chapter 14. What I'm going to meditate on this time is this chapter that is, starts out in 25, which ESV calls the cost of discipleship, that we go into our relationship with Christ. I mean, I didn't think about it either when I was becoming a Christian. I just started believing and I could not stop believing no matter how hard I tried. Was I adding up a cost? Was I figuring out a budget for my tower? Was I looking at this as a war where I was going to have a cost? I, I was not at all. Now I see the cost of the cross of Christ and that the cross always costs. It always leads to death, but it also leads to the kingdom of God. This life can be hard and it can, we can have some hard choices. And I'm going to give some thought to that cost. And what I'm going to pray about is preparing me. We can say these are hard sayings. These are all very hard sayings and we can feel dejected. Am I doing these things? Am I giving enough cost? Am I putting him in the top priority in my life? And you know what? If the answer is no, we're not supposed to have anxiety. We know he loves us like a hen gathers his chicks, a father loves his child, we ask him, help me in this. Help me be the kind of person who can stand the cost of this relationship. Let me be that person who can stand up no matter what. And what I'm going to share with other people is the fact that while things in Christianity can feel daunting, it's worth it. It is worth it to put Jesus first, and it is worth it for us to be his disciples and have him as our priority. He will help us get there. We will pray, and he will give us the path we need, the strength we need, the thing we need in order to do exactly what it is he's asking us to do. He just asks us to just participate a little bit in his miracles, and he will bring us the rest of the way. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Some days we have cheery days and some days we have some very tough days and we've had some very tough days this week. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. If you have anything you want to say to me, please email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'd love to hear it. Or if you'd like to, me to talk to your Bible study, anything like that, I'm happy to do that too. Just email me or you can also even send me a message on Twitter.